All right. So the Reno Court of Inquiry um, was held from January 13th to February 11th, 1879 in Chicago. And um, I heard this joke and it made me think of the little big horns. So it's a little goofy, but a doctor, an engineer, a rabbi, and a lawyer were debating who was the world's first professional. The doctor said it had to be a doctor. Who else could have helped with the world's first surgery, taken the rib out of Adam, and creating the first woman? The rabbi says, no way. It had to be a rabbi, since the Lord needed someone to help preach his message to Adam and the world. The engineer is like, you guys are wrong. It had to be a master engineer, because no one else could have created this organized world from utter chaos. And then the lawyer smiles and he says, hey, who do you think created all that chaos? And I think of Little Bighorn as this massive battle, so many unanswered questions, so many witnesses and testimony and stories and bodies. And you think, finally, there's an investigation. You know, it's going to take all of this unknown and it's going to narrow it down. We've got 26 days in Chicago. We've got 23 witnesses. We're finally going to get to the heart of the matter. We're finally going to figure it out. But the Reno Court of Inquiry actually just introduces more chaos into study of the Little Bighorn. Um, on the one hand, it is the official investigation. So you have a record of it, and that's wonderful, and it makes it very valuable. But even while the Reno Court of Inquiry was going on, the reporters were joking in the newspaper about how each eyewitness was describing a completely different battle. So lots of more things thrown up in the air, lots of contradictions, lots of fun to keep us busy for a long time. So, all right, this is just a quick outline so you kind of get a sense of where I'm going with things. Um, of course, there's the, the Little Bighorn fight and the immediate fallout. So the media frenzy, the comments from the military, who blamed Custer, who defended Custer. Um, then we'll go to Chicago, the Palmer House, the Reno Court of Inquiry itself. Then we'll do a brief introduction of the, uh, the court, the officers who sat on the court. Um, then we'll run down some of the witnesses, the eyewitnesses and um, the officers, as well as the enlisted and um, civilians. Closing argument, arguments from both sides, the verdict, and then kind of the repercussions afterwards. All right. Okay, you guys know the Little Bighorn. So I found this map just to give a sense of, um, I don't know, situationally stick ourselves and see how each column kind of worked its way across the battlefield. So it's not the best map, but it, it gives us a kind of bird's eye overview. Um, you see where they were all together until about noon on June 25th. And then Benteen is sent off on his scout to the left. Uh, Reno and Custer continue their columns are parallel to each other for a ways. And then they'll keep moving down until Reno is given his order to um, move down into the valley to the village, bring the Indians to battle and Custer will support him. You know, something along those lines is what everyone says is Custer's order to Reno. Um, then you see Reno's little arrow. He goes down, creates a skirmish line. Uh, the skirmish line peels back to a timber. They're in the timber, they're repulsed or overcome and he heads up to a hill and Benteen when he finishes up his scout, he'll meet Reno on that hill. Meanwhile, though, Custer, you can see he goes up to the bluffs. He comes around to the village on the other end. He does not come behind Reno the way Reno expects. Um, Reno and Benteen sort of organize on the hill, get their wounded, get the packs, the ammunition, which were behind Benteen with uh, Matthew and McDougal. And they slowly kind of move their way out to Custer's battlefield. The Indians come back up and they turn around, they return to the hill. Meanwhile, Custer and 222 
of his men are completely annihilated. Okay, so I know you guys know that, but for those of you who wanted a little refresher, that's how it looks. Okay, so immediately after the battle, um, I was surprised in you know, reviewing for this of how much of a pushback or blame Custer actually received, you know, from you have his uh, entire chain of command here for the most part. And, you know, Sheridan has this really sort of ambiguous um, blame of Custer, you know, it's as nice as you can be and still blame Custer for the debacle. Uh, he says that the uh, massacre, however you want to call it. It was an unnecessary sacrifice due to misapprehension and a super abundance of courage. So while it's awfully nice to say there's a super abundance of courage, definitely places the blame squarely on Custer himself. Um, Sturgis is not so nice. Colonel Sturgis, of course, lost a son. Uh, Jimmy Sturgis, who died with Custer and his body was never found. Uh, Custer was guilty of disobedience and sacrificing good men's lives to win notoriety for himself. So yeah, not much empathy for Custer from Sturgis. Terry, who was a lawyer, back to this troublemaking lawyers. Sorry if any of you guys are lawyers. Um, he writes a couple different, two different reports. One of them is leaked to the press. The one that's leaked to the press, it comes down a lot harder on Custer. He says, um, had the attack been deferred until Gibbon's column was up, I cannot doubt we should have been successful, which for you guys and anyone who studies Indian wars, seems like a very optimistic idea that Indians are going to wait for a lot of people to gather to fight them. Um, worst of all, though, would be the commander in chief, Grant, who comes out pretty hard on Custer with I regard Custer's massacre as a sacrifice of troops brought on by Custer himself that was wholly unnecessary, wholly unnecessary. And Libby Custer would never forgive Grant for that comment. Um, which brings us to the Custer defenders. So um, Libby, I think in a lot of uh, the discussions of the Reno Court of Inquiry, uh, a lot of blame is sort of cast on Libby for stirring things up and um, sort of saying negative things about Benteen and Reno. But having been part of the military community, I think that Libby was on the defensive as soon as she was able. I mean, she was just devastated by the death of Custer and so many of their male family members. And she had seen the entire military chain of command blame her husband for something she certainly did not think he was guilty of. So rather than Libby going on the attack, I think of her as going on the defense and having in some way trying to salvage something of her husband's reputation. But then there's this really interesting article um, that comes out in the papers. And I think it's in July, so soon after the battle. And it's supposedly written by an officer from the 7th. And a lot of people think it was Custer himself. And even at the time they thought it was Custer himself. And it was titled Voice from the Tomb. And it's about a scout that Reno had done um, around June 17th. So before the Battle of Little Bighorn, Reno had been tasked by Terry to do a scout to track the Sioux and see how many and in what direction, et cetera. And Reno doesn't do exactly what Terry wants him to do. So somebody writes this letter to the newspaper claiming that Reno had failed to obey the written orders. He, was, he had disobeyed um, Terry. And there's this great line that to me sounds like Custer where he says, faint heart never won lady fair, neither did it ever pursue and overtake an Indian village. So, I mean, it's, it's genius in its way, right? Like. Custer, if it is Custer, some people say it's Calhoun, but if it's Custer, he's potentially lining up Reno as the scapegoat in case the entire summer mission goes awry, right? And um, the letter also says Reno should be court-martialed because he disobeyed Terry's orders, like he's destroyed the su potential success of the mission. So whether it was Custer or somebody else, it is like um, this seed of doubt, I think, that's coming out because 
the early press, O'Kelly is with the 7th Cavalry. He writes a really positive article about Reno and Benteen, who are still on campaign. And he says, you know, they, they fought bravely. So this is the beginning of like the turning against that. And then you have Rosser, General Rosser. You guys probably know from his uh, Civil War battle with uh, Custer. He was a new Custer at West Point. He writes a couple articles as well, defending Custer. And um, Reno writes him back. So there's this like open debate in the newspapers between General Rosser and General Rosser, he had also worked with the seventh on a few surveys. So he knew other people in the seventh cavalry as well. So he comes out pretty um, hard against Reno and Benteen. Um, one of the things he says is, Custer did that which in 99 cases out of 100 will succeed, but this by chance was the fatal exception. You know that even in civilized warfare, the bolder movement was generally successful. The general who plans for the enemy and is counseled by fear is sure to fail. So Reno's seeing the tide change. You know, he's suddenly getting a lot of negative in the press. And then you have Whitaker. So Frederick Whitaker, he writes a book about Custer, 600 pages. And his, um, pretty much the end blame, or I don't know, the criticism is 100% on Reno and Benteen. So his conclusion is the massacre at the Little Bighorn was due to Reno's cowardice and Benteen's indifference. So like, there's no shades of gray there. He is directing it at Ren Reno. And um, Libby corresponded a great deal with Frederick Whitaker. She um, gave him letters. She introduced him to other members of the Custer family. She claimed she never read the book, but she definitely knew it was getting, getting written and was helpful in him getting the info. Another person who might've been helpful was Thomas Weir. That's the, there he is. So um, meanwhile, you have Thomas Weir, who's still with the 7th and campaigning, and then he's sent to New York after they get back to Fort Lincoln. Um, Thomas Weir is writing letters. He's writing letters to Libby. He's writing letters to Mrs. Cook, the, um, Adjutant Cook's mom in Canada. And while he doesn't come straight out, or there's not that many def definitive examples, he does tell Lib Libby, like, I got to see you. When I see you, I've got stuff to tell you, you know? So Libby is thinking, of course, there's this something going on that ought to be revealed to the general populace that will show that her husband did the right thing. And then here's one of um, an excerpt from one of Weir's letters to Mrs. Cook. Um, with our cherished ones delivered within our grasp, with our cherished ones deliverance within our grasp, we waited breathless for two hours for an order that never came, which is pretty damning against Reno. Um, unfortunately, December 9th, 1876, the day that Whitaker's biography of Custer comes out is the day that Thomas Weir dies. Um, he dies of uh, alcohol-related sickness, melancholy. There's all sorts of like 19th century euphemisms for it, but he dies. Nobody really knows what he, could have said at the Reno Court of Inquiry, but there starts circulating in the press that he made a sworn statement. And he's got this mysterious affidavit, affidavit out there where um, reportedly he says that he was able to watch the Custer fight. He was in full view of the Custer fight. He reported to Reno, urged that help be given to his comrades. Reno flatly refused to make the movement and openly was accused of cowardice. Weir alleges that when he moved out, the sound of firing was distinctly heard by the whole command. So that's a lot. And um, meanwhile, Whitaker doesn't give up. His book comes out and he still continues to write letters in the newspapers, trying to stir things up and to bring Reno to court. Reno can't take it. He decides himself to write a letter to the president of the United States and request a court of inquiry um, President Hayes does do this. Um, he appoints the court to decide. Reno says he's confident that he will prove that all of these accusations, all of the, the proliferation of camp gossip and rumor, none of it's true. He thinks it's unfounded. And 
here we go. So for, I, I always mix these two up, but a court of inquiry is not a court martial. Court martial is the actual trial of offenders who've broken military law, whereas the court of inquiry is an examination of the accusation. So I, I think of it as like a pretrial kind of thing. You know, it's they're making sure to how serious these accusations actually are. However, Reno, by requesting this, he was sort of opening a Pandora's box, I think, right? Um, sure, he wanted to restore his own honor. He was being called horrible things in the press. Um, but Article 42 of the Court Martial's manual I found from 1893, uh, the charges were really severe. So he was risking letting all of this dirty laundry be aired in the press, you know, and any officer or soldier who misbehaves himself before the enemy runs away or shamefully abandons any fort, post, or guard which he is commanded to defend or casts away his arms or ammunition shall suffer death or court-martial. So if those are the things that can bring somebody to court-martial, you know, you, you would think that Reno would not risk demonstrating that he did any of those things. And it's really interesting reading the Reno Court of Inquiry. There's a lot of questions about Reno throwing away a gun. And I, I always wonder like, why? Why would anybody care if in the heat of the battle he throws away a gun until I read this and see that that was a serious offense to take military property or take a weapon and toss it. So all of this is going on in the background. And then that brings us to Chicago, to the Palmer House, which was one of the nicest hotels in America. It cost uh, $2 million to build. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of the Great Chicago Fire. Uh, so the Palmer had been open for 13 days in 1871 when the Chicago Fire destroyed almost all of Chicago and they rebuilt it. And they rebuilt it and they made it fireproof. Um, but it was this really uh, opulent, beautiful place. It had telephones, elevators. It was one of the first to um, have, I don't know, bathrooms in the room. It had amazing things. They also invented the brownie in the dining room, the wife of Palmer. So uh, there were gold peacocks in the doors. There were gold chandeliers from Tiffany's. There were 800 silver dollars in the floor of the barber shop. You can see them in this uh, illustration between the tile, the little silver circles. So um, it was a really fine place to be. It was also happened to be near Sheridan's division of the Missouri, which had a fire in their offices nine days, I think, before the court of inquiry kicked off. So Sheridan and his entire staff, the office, they leased to the second floor of the Palmer. So they were all there. And I, I don't know, I, I just can't imagine the pressure that must have been on these young lieutenants that not only the scrutiny of the media on the testimony that was about to happen, but then they see just everybody, all those gold braids floating around the halls. So it was quite a place to be and um, must have been a really, stressful place to wander around if you were unsure of your testimony or of your, how you behaved at the Little Bighorn. Okay, so Reno, there he is in his uniform. Um, next to him is uh, Lyman Gilbert, who was the Deputy Attorney General of Pennsylvania. So Gilbert is Reno's lawyer. Um, Gilbert had been friends with Reno's wife's family in Harrisburg. So, um, Reno and Gilbert go quite a ways back. Um, Reno's wife is dead, but Gilbert is the executor of her estate. So he's actually the one giving their uh, Reno's son his allotment from the mother's uh, investments, whatever. So they have a history. Um, he was reputed to be quite a, a good lawyer. If you do a Google search, he's still talked about in Harrisburg and his um, law firm is still around, which is pretty amazing. Uh, Jesse Lee, Lieutenant Lee of the 9th Infantry, he would serve as the um, prosecutor, I guess we want to say, or I want to say, knowing how civilian courts work. But um, 
he's not. He was a judge advocate. He was a recorder. His actual role um, is defined as he, he conducts the case for the government. So he was in charge of presenting all of the evidence, but um, he wasn't really like gunning to prove Reno guilty in the way we would have in a movie. Um, let's see. So I don't know, people like to poke at Lee being young and inexperienced and that he was really out of his league going against uh, Gilbert, but I think he did an amazing job. He had tried two court martials in the past before, so he wasn't entirely new to courtroom situation. Um, and yes, he was young, he was a member of the military, the members of the court were much higher ranking than him. A lot of the guys he had to question were higher ranking than him, but I think he's really sharp. And when he needs to, he really gives people hell, excuse me. Um, King, or uh, this is Colonel King, the president of the court or the head judge, also the ninth infantry, Lee is actually his adjutant. Um, you guys will recognize um, Colonel, sorry, Wesley Merritt, who during the Civil War had sort of been a rival of Custer. And Bob, I know you know this guy. So there's a Lieutenant Colonel Royal, Royal of the Third Cavalry, who had been with um, Crook at the Rosebud. And what I would give to have been in on a coffee break of that court to hear what they said about uh, the Rosebud fight in comparison to Little Bighorn. Okay, so finally, um, the Reno Court of Inquiry starts. And first few days are mostly uh, preliminary things, um, reviewing what they'll allow in court, um, going over the list of witnesses, who will question first. Um, I think Jesse Lee gets to choose maybe the order of the uh, witnesses and he speaks, he is the first one to question them. Um, McGuire, that's his map. McGuire, I think, is the first witness. And uh, sort of like most of the Arena Court of Inquiry, there's all sorts of uh, controversy about McGuire's map. And every witness says, oh, but the map is wrong. But it's the best we've got, right? It's the original documents, the closest we can get. So. Um, things really start to take off on the third day when uh, Lieutenant George Wallace takes a stand. General Sheridan is sitting in the courtroom that day and can't imagine who else was there, but uh, probably terrifying. And uh, Wallace is fascinating to me because his testimony most perfectly backs up Reno's defense. Um, he, is the perfect witness for Gilbert and Reno. And it's, you couldn't script it better. I'm a fiction writer. I couldn't write, I mean, I'm going to in my own book, but you couldn't write a better defense than what Wallace gets on the stand and says about Reno. And what makes that even more interesting to me is the next witness is Fred Gerard, who is the ideal witness for Jesse Lee and um, the prosecutor. So you just have these two guys who, you know, they both have excellent reputations. Uh, they both, you know, Gerard has fought Indians before. They have wonderful experience. They've been interviewed, they're respected and they contradict everything the other person says. So it's amazing to pit the two of them together. And I don't know, I didn't think that could happen in real life, but um, here we go. This is pretty much, the argument that we will see again and again. Um, I think I mentioned this already, but uh, Jesse Lee, his first question is always, what is Custer's order? Or what was Reno's order um, that day? And pretty much there's slight variations, but everyone uh, will say that Reno was told to like, uh, chase after Indians or charge down, charge the village, bring them to battle and Custer will support him. So these two, that's like the one thing these two gentlemen agree on. I think Wallace, Wallace will say that it was Cook, the adjutant who gave the order 
And Gerard mentions that he saw Custer talking to Reno, but pretty much on the same page there. All right, um, then Lee will go through these other questions. And this sort of makes up the body of all the arguments. Um, so Lee will wanna know how long was the fight in the Valley? Um, how, what was the state of the ammunition? Uh, how sound was the position in the timber? How did they depart the timber? Uh, how many Native Americans were there? Um, did they, were they aware of a Custer fight? Could they hear it? And did they see Custer in any way? So we get Wallace's responses. Um, Wallace will say that they're down in the valley and they're fighting for about 45 minutes. He says that um, the soldiers and officers down there, they used up the ammo they had on their person, um, that they were surrounded and in a bad position, you know, not they couldn't fight or they couldn't stay. Uh, he will adamantly say that they charged out of the timber. He says, we charged to get out of there. We had to go through the Indians and that could only be done by a charge. So this, um, it sounds like semantics, right? Reno will claim that he, it was a charge and he will, he'll always say he charged out of the timber. It was not a retreat, it was a charge. And again, if you go back to that Article 42, I think it's important for Reno's defense that they were never running from the enemy. But um, again, so Wallace will back that up. Um, Wallace will say there's 9,000 Native American warriors they're fighting. He'll also say he didn't hear any firing or well, he only heard a little bit of firing. He thought the Indians were in the village firing for their own amusement which is a direct quote, which is bizarre, but anyway, sorry. Um, and he'll say that when asked if he saw Custer after Custer sent Reno down into the valley, he will say, yeah, I saw Custer when he was dead. And Lee will keep pressing him and say, well, I, I don't mean that. I mean, between Custer or Reno leaving Custer and you guys traveling down and then finding the dead bodies, did you see Custer again? And Lee's trying to see, did he know that Custer was going up over the bluffs and coming around the village? And Wallace, it's really hard for him to give him a straight answer and he actually does not. He says, that I do not know. So he won't say if he saw Custer on the bluffs. Then we have Gerard. He says the length of the Valley fight was about 10 minutes, 10 minutes on the skirmish line, five minutes in the timber. He um, claims to have fired seven shots and that they were at like a pretty far distance. Um, he says they absolutely could have held the timber, timber. It was a good spot to be, but if the men had been determined. Um, when asked how they left the timber, he said that it was not a charge. He had assumed they were actually charging into the village, but then suddenly he and Charlie Reynolds noticed they were going away from the village. It was pell-mell, there was no order. They thought they were gonna come back and get them. They didn't. So he said it was every man for himself. He said there were about two to 3,000 um, hostiles. When asked if he heard firing from Custer's uh, column, he said he heard it start about 15 minutes after Reno left um, the timber and that it was continuous firing and for about two hours. And then it was heavy when it was at Custer's battlefield. Um, he also said that, yes, he did see Custer up on the bluffs when they were down to Timber. So uh, you can imagine that Reno and Gilbert did not like Gerard's testimony. Um, Gilbert would try very hard to undermine Gerard in every way possible. He uh, said, well, you know, Reno fired you. So clearly you have a bone to pick with Reno um, and Gerard or Lee will come back and say, well, Custer rehired Gerard and Gerard is still working at Fort Lincoln. So he's doing an okay job as a um, interpreter. Uh, so then Gilbert will switch tactics and he will continue to ask Gerard about his personal life. And if Gerard is married to an Indian woman and then if he has Indian children, and he makes some comments about how he wants to know how intimate Gerard is with the enemy, sort of like sleeping with the enemy idea. So he, he's trying, he's, 
he's doing the tricks that we think of lawyers doing in Perry Mason or whatever. So um, it gets a little heated and this is probably the fun of reading the Arena Court of Inquiry. There's some amusing stuff in there. Okay, so now the officers. Um, I am grouping the officers into two slides, mostly to save time because I can't go through everybody. Um, it's not black and white, you know, the officers are not like, hurrah, hey, hey, Reno was awesome. There's plenty of commentary that I'm sure Reno did not want to hear from each officer really, but in general, they were much more diplomatic. You know, they did not come out hard against Reno's behavior. Um, they were pretty cautious and they're active duty military, you know, and they're talking to all of their superiors in court. Like, it, I think it's understandable either way. Or they really agreed with how Reno conducted himself in battle, you know, like, again, that's part of what's so difficult about untying this knot. Um, we have Varnum and I said earlier how uh, Weir had died and that was sort of a disappointment to Libby and to Whitaker because they had hoped he would be a strong witness for them. But um, Whitaker wrote a letter to Libby and he said, don't worry, we have Varnum and we have Edgerly and they will give us Weir's side. So there was great hopes that Varnum would reveal something shocking about Reno. Um, the press called Varnum bald and brave and they described him as having a four inch part in his hair, poor guy. Um, so one thing that Varnum, many of the witnesses mention is even though he had said on the stand that um, he didn't think there were enough men to hold the timber, Supposedly during the retreat, he was shouting, for God's sakes, men don't run. They're wounded and killed, and killed down there and we have to go back and get them. And over and over again on the stand, people remember him saying that and repeat it. And uh, Barnum also, when pressed by both sides to remark about whether Reno displayed any cowardice, he really didn't want to answer the question. And he comes up with, um, just a perfectly ambivalent. Certainly there was no sign of cowardice or anything of that sort in Reno's conduct, nothing especially the other way either. So um, next, Moylan. And I really wish somebody would write an article about Moylan or Moylan's conduct down in the timber because I think his company started to um, fray sooner than anyone else. And um, if you think that it was a kind of hysterical retreat, I think that Moylan had something to do with that. He's the one, or they said he ran out of ammo. Um, I believe they were the first ones to sort of uh, come off the skirmish line. They um, seemed to be dispersed in the timber. Uh, the math doesn't add up if he really had like the youngest people or like the most amount of new recruits, but he thinks he does. And he will say that in court. Um, anyway, but whatever may have happened in the timber on the stand, Moyland is impeccable. He is, uh, speaks loudly and all the reporters love him because I guess everybody else is like whispering and they have a trouble hearing them, but they love how direct Moylan is. And he makes it sound like everything went off in the timber perfectly, really organized. Um, everybody was together, everybody heard orders, you know, they had no choice, the Indians had inf infiltrated the timber, they had to leave, uh, it was an orderly charge, et cetera, et cetera. So according to Moylan, everything went off the way it should have, maybe it did. Um, and one of his quotes that's memorable is, I would rather be alive on the hill than dead in the timber. All right, here's spunky Luther Hare. Um, he's from Texas and, uh, Supposedly during the retreat or at, on the hill, he was shouting, I'm a mother beeper from Texas, come and get me or something feisty like that. But um, Hare also thought that they had to leave the timber. Um, the soldiers were overwhelmed. He said the retreat was well closed up and it was like a charge and that the confusion didn't hit until the river crossing. 
Um, and he also thought the Hill was a better position to be in. And again, he thinks that they would have died if they hadn't made the movement they did. Okay, more officers. Um, Edgerly. Edgerly was not with Reno in the timber. He was with the Benteen column and he was with Weir, he's D Company. Um, and again, I mentioned him earlier, he was one of Libby and Whitaker's high hopes that he would sort of have that smoking gun. Um, Edgerly says Reno was excited. He did say that they could hear the firing from Custer's fight from the hilltop and everybody should have heard it. Um, something else interesting that Edgerly says was uh, when asked that first question from Lee, what were the orders every, or, you know, Reno got, or that Benteen got, he says, Captain Benteen was ordered to move off to the left and strike anything he came to, and Major Reno was sent to the right. Now, yeah, I mean, you read that quickly, and of course, that's, that's what happened, but I, I don't know, sort of a curious thing for him to mention Reno and Benteen in the same set of orders. So it could have just been him summing things up, or there could have been a little bit more knowledge about what the other columns were tasked with doing. And that's gonna come up again a little later. Um, see, Godfrey is stubborn and I don't know, he's wonderful on the stand. He sort of uh, fights a little bit with uh, Reno's counsel about some things that they're trying to get him to say and he refuses. Um, he said, I heard two distinct follies. I think it was loud enough. I was as far away from it as any in the command. And besides, I am a little deaf naturally. So it's pretty unforgettable. You find that in most of our little bighorn books, they all love to say that Godfrey was deaf and he could hear the fighting. Um, he also comes down the hardest, I think. And for the officers in court, he will say that Reno displayed nervous timidity. And that's the closest they will say on the stand. Um, to Reno's bad behavior. Matthew defends Custer. Um, Matthew is with the pack trains. And um, when asked if he thought Custer would have abandoned the troops, he says, no, he wouldn't have abandoned his wounded. And whether he is sort of a backhanded slap at Reno there, because Reno did abandon wounded in the timber, I don't know. Uh, McDougal was also with the packs. He expresses the same sentiment that almost all of them do about they thought they would have died if they had not either left the timber or if they had, um, when they had made that movement out to Custer, if they had continued in that trajectory, they would have died. Um, I have DeRudio here. I know people sort of bash him, especially, well, Benteen loves to bash him in his letters, but DeRudio has some sort of crazy tales. I don't know, um, but Matthew on the stand, when asked about Reno's cowardice, he mentions a comment that DeRudio had made in the past. And it was, if we had not been commanded by a coward, we would all have been killed. And um, I don't know, I, I think that's a, a really important line or it sort of sticks with me when deciding if Reno had behaved properly or not. And ultimately it seems that the officers did think they lived because they left. Okay, here's our guy, Benteen. Um, Benteen has been the golden boy of the press the entire time he's in Chicago. Uh, even before he left Fort Lincoln, or not Fort Lincoln, Bismarck. When he gets on the train at Bismarck, there are reporters waiting at the train station all that he's traveling with a couple other officers. Everybody else is really hesitant. They're staying away from the press. Nobody else wants to talk to anybody, not Benteen. Benteen chats with everybody and he'll, he says it's all Custer's fault, um, which won't surprise us who know Benteen from our reading. But it's, it's shocking to me when I read these articles. Um, the journalists know about the division in the 7th Cavalry. They're aware before the Reno Court of Inquiry that Benteen is anti-Custer and that there, there are issues um, within. So I don't know, I, I find that really fascinating. I mean, 
I, I just can't ha imagine unless it's from the Washington fight when uh, Ventine was reported to have written that article about how the Custer um, was shooting all the horses, you know? I mean, it's just, it's really interesting that the reporters are so aware of kind of like this infighting that um, I wouldn't imagine would be sort of common knowledge at the time that would only be because we've read the golden letters, you know, but they do, it's in the article. Um, they still love him. They love Ventine. He's a charmer. Uh, they call him the savior of the seventh. They call him the hero of a thousand fights and the joy of the ladies' hearts. When Ventine takes the stand, they, it's the, um, the courtroom is full, standing room only. There's more women that day than any other day. They're all asking him for his autograph to fill up their little autograph books. So it's quite a, uh, I don't know, feels like a carnival or something. And Bentine, he performs, you know, he does. He does what the reporters want him to do. He's kind of difficult. He, he's funny, he's witty. He doesn't like to give a straight answer. You know, he's, uh, he's hamming it up, I think. So um, Bentine will claim again and again that he doesn't think Custer had a plan that Custer had no plan and he loves to say that. And that's a really strong um, defense. Reno will use it as well in Gilbert. So he'll say that uh, when Custer came down from the crow's nest, Custer said that he didn't see any Indians. Um, Benteen thinks that Custer didn't even think there was a village. Um, Benteen will say that his oblique to the left was a senseless order. And uh, Lieutenant Lee gets a little upset with him at this point because he's claiming uh, his commander made senseless orders and Lee will press him on this and Lee, or sorry, Benteen will just not budge. He, he does not think that Custer did anything right that day. Um, he mentions Sergeant Knipe who comes back, who's sent back um, to hurry along the packs. Benteen will say that he always sent him back to McDougal. He wasn't in charge of the packs. He had nothing to do with it. Uh, it's very unapologetic the entire time. It's amazing. So uh, when Benteen's asked about his final order from Custer, and you can see it in that illustration down below, that's of Martin bringing Benteen the um, last message. Benteen, as the showman he is, he whips that letter right out of his pocket. He has it ready this ratty tattered piece of paper you see up there on the screen and he reads it aloud. Benteen, come on, big village, be quick, bring packs, bring packs. Um, he also says that Martin, when he gave him the letter or sorry, the order from Custer, that Martin said that the uh, hostiles were skedaddling and therefore Benteen didn't you know, see the necessity of trying to rush the packs along. Uh, Lee will say, but your commanding officer said, hurry up. Like, why would you listen to an enlisted guy? And Benteen thinks he's between him. He's between the packs. The Native Americans can't get around him. Like he has an answer for everything. And he's, he's great. He, it's fun to read anything by Benteen. He says the um, pack train was really far behind them. He says at one point that was seven miles behind them. Um, when asked if he could have gone to Custer, he says, yes, sir. And we would have all been there yet. We would have all been killed again. Um, and when he's asked about seeing the Custer fight, the bodies, after uh, Terry comes up, he says that, yeah, it looked like Custer, it was a panic stricken route. They were scattered like corn. You know, he can't even give Custer like a noble death. Um, so one thing that I find really interesting with uh, Lee's question of Benteen and kind of comparing it to how we look at the uh, relationships in the seventh cap today is uh, three times Lieutenant Lee will ask Benteen if he had an amicable relationship with General Custer. And I mean, we get on fights like this on Facebook, right? In our little big horn chat rooms about how it doesn't matter if Benteen didn't like Custer, he was a professional soldier. He, they all still would have done their jobs. It wouldn't have made any difference in the world if these guys don't like each other. But you have 
Lieutenant Lee, who is an infantryman, he is active duty military. He's been an Indian agent. He's been out on the frontier. He's been in the military since the Civil War himself. He sees something there and he continues to ask and Benteen doesn't want to answer the question and he dances around it. Gilbert objects. Um, and finally he says something like, I was it felt as amicable toward Custer then as I do now or something double speak that Benteen is so great at. But I do find it interesting that Lee found it important enough to bring up in a military inquiry and whether he was trying to show that Benteen didn't have faith in his commander or um, they had trust issues. There was a different issue than something as petty as liking somebody or not. I mean, I think it's an interesting thing to point out. Um, okay. So those are most of our officers. I'll just do a really quick rundown of um, enlisted and civilian eyewitnesses. You get poor Doc Porter. Gilbert was not kind to him on the stand. Um, Doc Porter, I think he was called, a, Gilbert called him as a witness, but they didn't like what he had to say on the stand. Um, he said they left a lot of, or they left the wounded in the timber. He said that Rena was embarrassed. He didn't know whether to stay or to leave in the timber. He said no one could find their horses. He said there's no order for a retreat. So he, he describes a lot of uh, chaos to go back to the original anecdote. Um, he says, I expected the command to be charging the Indians, but instead the Indians were charging the command. So Gilbert um, points out that Doc Porter was really nervous and he tries to sort of turn it around and say he he was faint at heart himself that like he was the coward and he was too busy to pay attention to anything Reno was doing. And then we have George Herndine, who um, you see in this illustration here. So Herndine was um, the gentleman who is why we all know about Bloody Knife being shot in the head and um, the blood and brains splashing on Reno. They're inside the timber. They're gathered in this little glade with their horses. Um, I think George Lorenz, another uh, a young enlisted man is shot and Bloody Knife is shot. And Herondine um, implies that that's what sparked like this sort of mad dash out of the timber. Um, that's when Reno shouts, mount, dismount, and sort of like, if you wanna live, follow me. Um, and then here's Trumpeter Martin, who I mentioned in the Benteen slide. He um, talks about like the last moments of being with Custer's column, which is a sort of interesting testimony there. Um, he says how Custer looked down at the village. He thought he caught them napping. Um, Custer took off his hat and said, courage boys, we have got them. Some sad final lines, huh? Um, and that when Adjutant Cook gave Martin the note, the final order to bring to Benteen, Cook said, I want you to take this dispatch to Colonel Benteen and go as fast as you can. So again, speed is stressed. And uh, Martin, another interesting thing he says is that the packs were well together, that they were not far apart as Benteen will claim. <laughs> okay, so um, Sergeant Davern, He's Reno's orderly. And um, like Moylan, I, I really wish somebody would do an in-depth article on him. Um, his testimony, I find it kind of electric personally. So Lee is getting, you know, about three fourths of the way through the trial. I think Lee's getting tired. Uh, He's been writing down all his questions on paper and reading them off his page. And a lot of the same questions he repeats. Again, he's not the lawyer, he's the infantryman. And um, he asked Davern the way he asked everybody else, like what's the order that Reno gets? And everyone's kind of expecting the same old thing. And Davern replies that um, Cook says, Mr. Gerard has reported the Indian village is three miles ahead and moving in the general direction, you take three companies and drive everything before you, you know, same old thing. But then young Irish Davern says, Colonel Benteen will be on your left and he will have the same instructions. And Lieutenant Lee hears this and he's like, wait, what a minute, what, what'd you say? Like, could you repeat that? 
and Davern repeats it. So uh, Lee is sort of amazed that like Benteen is suddenly mentioned in Reno's orders because that hasn't been said before from any of the other eyewitnesses. Um, that's why I think it's electric is because there is again this like very light hint of maybe there was more to Custer's orders than we know today or that Benteen and Reno are letting on. Um, maybe there's more awareness about what the other columns may or may not be doing. And uh, Gilbert will really try to shake Davern up, but he is adamant. Um, he will say that that's his job, is he's the orderly. His job is to um, listen to orders. The duties of an orderly are to take orders around to the command. You know, he can't shake Davern's um, testimony. Davern has one other thing that's interesting is a lot of things are interesting, but all that I can say tonight. Um, he talks about a conversation with Weir later on when they're on top of the hill about seeing the Indians fighting Custer or Circulene at least. And um, he says to Weir, like, this is why there are no Indians attacking us right now. Look, clearly they've just gone and they're fighting Custer. And Weir's like, wow, yeah. And when asked like, well, what happened after that? Davern says there was nothing done. So again, some inertia on the hill, according to Davern. All right, and now we get to some sort of fun testimony. Um, we have the civilian packers, Fret and Churchill. Um, I haven't really mentioned this yet, but it really doesn't come up in the Reno Court of Inquiry until we get to the packers. Uh, this question of whether Reno had been drinking or not. And that's, again, that's one of the things we talk about a lot on um, group chats and stuff and debate, whether Reno had been drunk during the fight. So um, we get these Packers testifying and they have this story about uh, the night of the 25th. So after the battle, Reno sees them talking and comes over and says something to them about the mules. They don't understand him. They can't, his speech is slurred. Uh, they question him. He slaps one of the guys. He spills whiskey all over them. He takes out his gun. He threatens to shoot the guys. Like it's a, an odd story. They both say almost identical versions of it. Um, whatever. Of course, Gilbert says that they don't know what they're talking about. Benteen and Reno will say that the Packers were like skulking, they were stealing, nobody should listen to them. Um, they had a bone to pick again with Reno, but when Matthew is on the stand and he's asked, and Matthew was in charge of the pack training, if he had any problems with the Packers, he said he had no problems with them whatsoever. So it's kind of just an interesting side note. Um, one other thing, they say that they, the Packers say when they came up after um, reaching Reno on the hill, they put out the ammunition packs. And after all these people said, oh, we ran out of ammunition, the timber, nobody actually opened up and pulled out any of the ammunition. And they claimed, both of them, that they just closed the boxes of ammunition up and packed it up again afterwards. Um, I've got this headline here. A garrulous Packer testified Reno was seriously wounded on the hill and that it was not an Indian bullet, but a cork that inflicted, inflicted the injury. Um, the headlines, uh, the reporters had a lot of fun reporting on this case and there's a lot of humor there. Um, anyway, there's all these great comments throughout. Okay, so Reno. Now, Lieutenant Lee, reads Reno's original battle report that he wrote in July of 1876, reads aloud in court. In that report, Reno says that there was firing heard from the Custer fight area. He says, in hindsight, he realizes that Custer must have been trying to support um, Reno by flanking the village. And he says that they fought about 2,500 Indians. Um, when Reno testifies, he will contradict those things. Lee will ask him about it. And um, Reno will say that his testimony in 1879 
is much more reliable than the original report he made in 1876. Um, Reno doesn't have to testify. Reno has to actually like ask the court's permission to testify and he wants to. So again, like Reno, Reno thinks he, I think Reno thinks he did the right thing. Um, as always, Lee starts out asking what the order was and Rena replies, General Custer directs you to take as rapid a gate as prudent, charge the village and you will be supported by the whole outfit. Um, Reno says that the only way that Custer could support him in that situation though is by coming from behind. So here we go with his first contradiction of his original order. He says that Custer couldn't have flanked the village, that he was expecting him from behind. That's what Custer had to do. He didn't do it. Um, Reno had no choice but to leave. Lee will ask him, did cowardice prompt you to leave the timber? Reno will say, no, it wasn't cowardice. Um, that was the only way to get out anyone alive. And a lot of officers support that, you know, as we've heard. Um, Lee will ask him what happened to the wounded. And uh, Reno, who's not nearly as diplomatic as some of the others, says, I suppose the Indians killed him. And uh, Lee will ask a lot of questions about the wounded. Um, and I don't know, Reno has some callous answers, but. Um, so we talked earlier about Davern and how there may have been um, an addendum in the Custer's orders that Reno would know that Benteen was on his left and had similar orders to push everything forward, right? So when Lee brings this up to Reno, Reno says, I absolutely did not. Like, no, that never happened. And I had no idea where Benteen was. Benteen could have been in the Rosebud for all I know. And um, Lee's like, well, why would Benteen be in the Rosebud? And he says, oh, I don't know. So um, Lee also says to him, had you reasons to believe that Benteen would not join that fight? And Reno has to, well, he answers, I never gave the subject a thought. So he's dancing around some things himself. Um, Reno does, uh, he recites Benteen's final orders a couple times. Um, and Lee asks him, you know, so what, hey, what, what did you say? What was that order again? And he recites it perfectly, except he forgets the be quick. Both times when he says uh, the written order to Custer, he forgets the be quick part and Lee catches it. And again, this is, I think Lee is good. He's good, he's subtle. But he said, did it not occur to you that with only 225 men, Custer might need someone to be quick? And Reno's response is, it never occurred to me at all. 225 could hold off quite a number of Indians if they are properly disposed. So he does not mention the fact that he has all the ammo. Um, Lee asks him if he went into the fight confident in Custer. And uh, Reno says, I had no confidence in his ability as a soldier. Um, when asked about the drinking, Reno has no problem admitting that he hit the Packers and he threatened to shoot them, but he says he was not drunk. He said he did not have a drop to drink until the firing ceased, which I can't imagine today that somebody would rather admit to like threatening to kill somebody, but they won't say that they had had some whiskey. Um, and uh, here is an argument. I didn't mention this earlier. This is Benteen uses this argument as well. Reno says that he's convinced there was no command down there when I got out of the woods, that they were all dead. And um, so I guess, according to military doctrine, the only time you can not obey a direct order from your superior is if the person who issued that order is dead. And Benteen will say this also in his testimony that um, he thought by the time he got the order the written order from Custer from uh, Trumpeter Martin that Custer was already dead. And you see Reno using the same argument to sort of as like their Trump card. Okay, uh, quickly, I'll just go through. 
So Gilbert, he's slick, he's good, he's charming. In his closing arguments, he will tear apart everyone who said something negative about Reno. Um, so young Davern, who claims that there's, you know, an additional order tacked on there and some other things about, he's also the one who imp implies that uh, Reno may have thrown away his gun. Davern, as Reno's orderly, has some pretty damning uh, evidence there or whatever. But he will say about Davern that he was a private soldier of limited intelligence. Um, of Gerard, he will accuse him of having um, stolen from Fort Lincoln. Um, he calls Herodine and the Packers camp followers. He says of Dr. Porter, if he had the gift of courage, he did not have it with him on that day. So he tries very hard to uphold the evidence given by the officers, the testimony, but to um, dismiss anything said by enlisted men and civilians. Um, Gilbert quotes a lot from Wallace and Benteen, of course. Um, and the way I have in this talk, Gilbert talks about how many people mentioned that if they had not left the timber, they would be dead, which is a pretty good argument for leaving. Um, sort of his summation is that Reno showed no cowardice in the timber. His retirement was not only within his discretion, but was the result of consultation with officers and endorsed by others. And on account of the number of Indians and the manner in which Custer and his command was destroyed, um, Reno's retreat had no effect whatsoever upon any other command than his own. Um, he also talks about the gunshot, the faint and scattered shots, saying that it did not seem like a severe struggle. And then again, the whole idea that Custer was dead. Custer was dead before Martin reached Benteen. Custer was dead before Reno could have gone to even save him from the hill. Excuse me. Um, and this is this is great. The the press sort of uh, makes fun of Gilbert for this little bit of uh, theatrics, but Gilbert sort of conjures up the ghost of Custer himself, and he says that Custer would say to the surviving Seventh Cav. Our efforts failed to be a mutual support because of the overwhelming force that confronted each of us and your honor takes no stain. So there's some artistic license there. Um, and then you get Lieutenant Lee. Recorder Lee goes last with his closing arguments. He is pretty irate about um, the way Gilbert tore apart the civilian and uh, enlisted testimony. He says, prejudice either for or against a witness solely on his relation to the army, whether officer, enlisted or citizen would pervert the ends of justice and render a trial or inquiry a farce. What did I do? Okay. Um, he says that Custer absolutely had a plan and the plan was for Reno to charge the hostiles as soon as you find them and we will support you. Uh, Lee pulls no punches. He said, Reno disobeyed. Reno left the timber, not on account of the losses that had occurred, but on account of what might occur. Um, Reno's casualties occurred not in charging toward the village, but in going away from it. He says, Reno abandoned wounded and did not cover the retreat at the river. Um, he, says that Reno is responsible for the annihilation of Custer. So he comes down really hard. Um, he said, Reno did not have faith in Custer, but Custer had confidence in Reno. Uh, Custer received no support from seven companies due to indecision and tardiness. Custer demanded cooperation with his come quick order. The place for concentration was on the field of battle against the enemy, nowhere else. Um, he also didn't believe that Reno and Benteen didn't know that Custer was in danger. He said, every witness save Reno and Captain Benteen admits to knowing the commanding officer was in grave danger. Um, and he Lee sort of finishes up with, it is but natural that almost every officer arrived at the conclusion that what they did was be the best thing to do. Esprit de corps is a strong inducement. So here we go. They wait and they wait. Um, things are sort of leaked out to the press. 
that the verdict is not going to find uh, Reno guilty. But the final verdict comes out in March and the, they say the conduct of the officers throughout was excellent. And while subordinates in some instances did more for the safety of the command by brilliant displays of courage than Major Reno, there was nothing in his conduct which requires amniaversion from this court. And I looked up amniaversion as um, criticism. So um, Whitaker, of course, is furious. And so even before the final verdict comes out, he knows, he knows that they're not gonna find uh, Reno guilty. So he writes this long, almost insane article about it being a white wash and he accuses just all of army higher command of protecting the reputation of the military, sacrificing Custer, um, hushing things up because it was the easiest thing to do. Um, later on, years later, uh, Wesley Merritt or Colonel Merritt will say, the officers wouldn't tell us anything and we could do more, no more than damn Reno with faint praise. And even farther in the future than that, there's this wonderful, well, I don't know, wonderful because I love the whole Libby Custer side of things, but um, Jesse Lee, so Recorder Lee, who the acting sort of prosecutor, he writes this long letter to Libby in 1897. And um, if he can, I would search for the whole letter because it's amazing insight into everything from Terry's um, criticism of Custer to Benteen and Reno. And he's, unlike Reno, he is diplomatic. So he doesn't really come all out and say it, as you can see from this snippet here. But he um, points out that the result was caused by jealousy, self-interest. Um, he is appalled that the living could extol themselves for prudence and delay and condemn the dead as rash and impetuous. And that authority through inexperience sought to evade the responsibility through a loophole, loophole of escape. So Lee seems in hindsight to look back and feel that there was some injustice done, or at least the entire truth did not come to light. Okay. Woo. I, I didn't turn on my timer. So I don't know if you guys have been watching okay, here. Okay, it's not Tuesday. <laughs> All right, I think I, uh, well, this is the last slide. So we're good. I, I hope it wasn't an hour, um, but let's see. So what they all left behind, Whitaker. Whitaker, furious Whitaker. He kept writing books um, at 50. He came home one night, he got into his dressing robe. He was walking up the stairs of his Mount Vernon house and he fell down them and the gun in his pocket shot him in the head. Crazy story. And he died and uh, his family was not found guilty. So he had a wife and three daughters. Uh, it was just a freak accident, supposedly. And that was the end of Whitaker. Um, Reno, Reno, and before the end of 1879, so the same year as the court, uh, Reno Court of Inquiry, he would be court-martialed again and dismissed from the army. Um, he ended up marrying a widow who I think was a naval officer's wife, um, but she would divorce him and sue him for neglect and abandonment. Uh, he never gave up trying to get himself reinstated into the army. He wrote letters after letters after letters. Um, he developed tongue cancer and he died at the age of 54. That was in 1889. He was buried in an unmarked grave. Um, in 1967, he was reinterred with military honors at the Custer National Cemetery, Little Bighorn. So, and that's his uh, tombstone from the cemetery today. Um, ben Teen. Uh, Benteen was suspended for drunken disorderly conduct as well in 1887, but President Cleveland reduced his sentence. He would retire from the army in 1888. He wrote a lot of letters. Oh, and they're fantastic. I highly recommend that you guys um, get the golden letters if you haven't read them already. And he also has some wonderful letters to the photographer D.F. Barry. Um, in these letters, he would just skewer at everybody, everybody. It's amazing, um, especially Custer and Libby, but even like friends of his. So he just 
had incredible ire. Um, he died in 1898 in Atlanta and he's buried in Arlington. And that's a picture of his grave there. Um, Libby, so Libby would continue on to write three memoirs about her life with Custer, still in print today. Uh, she traveled all over the world. Um, she traveled giving lectures about Custer and in her way, rehabilitating his, um, his name, excuse me, she um, always wrote letters back to all, especially soldiers who wrote her. Um, when Custer died, she had nothing. He left her in debt, but she managed to um, accrue $100,000 by the time she died, just shy of her 91st birthday. Um, you can see these photos down below there. So there's uh, Custer, She's buried. she was buried in the shadow of, sorry, Libby was buried in the shadow of Custer's grave at West Point. And I think that's exactly where she wanted to be, you know, right there near him and sort of bolstering him up. Um, you can see these photos of President Taft in 1910 in Monroe. I think that was probably the high point of her widowhood is that she had, um, she helped this equestrian statue um, be erected in Monroe, Michigan, which is where she was and where she had met Custer, uh, still standing today. So that's it. All right, I think we have time to go over things if anybody wants to. Um, yeah, I uh, thanks Thank for you very to much, guys. Siobhan, that was excellent. <laughs> um, and please, uh, Anyone have any questions?